l'aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza Sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. Buonasera a tutti. Good evening everyone. Good evening to those who are here with us in person, those who are joining us. I'm, our, our guest is coming shortly. Um, Gemma Calabrese had a, a small health problem that uh, discouraged the, the journey here, but uh, she's still joining us. Good evening, Gemma. Good evening, everyone. And we should hopefully see her shortly. And here she is. Do you want to tell us uh, why we're seeing you virtually? So, I I'm really sorry to have to meet you like this. I. I got uh, when when I got sick and I wasn't able to come. I I I was moved to tears. I've had health problems for for quite a while now, and they 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 crop up every now and again. And it just so happened that they did this time. The other day when I was interviewed for the meetings newspaper, they asked me, "What what do you what do you expect is going to come out from this uh, conference?" And I said, uh, a, "A lot of affection." If I don't have this affection, you, you'll you'll give it to me, even uh, through the screen here. I don't know if you can hear the applause, Gemma, but it sounds like uh, the people are happy to hear from you. She can't hear us, but still. Next time they'll uh, they'll scream and shout just so you can hear us. Adesso si è sentito. Now you can hear us. There you go. 
so let's start this uh, this chat, which even in this circumstance in the, will still be very important for all of us. 50 years ago, let's start from then, Italy wasn't in a much better state than what it is now. Faced with uh, the challenges of today, we, we often, especially those who are older, say, oh, things were better before. The temptation is uh, to talk of the good times without forgetting what those times actually were like. 50 years ago, Gemma was a, a young mother and wife. She was 25. She had two young uh, children and another on the way. She's married to a police commissioner, Luigi Calabresi, who was the, the, the victim of a, of a horrible uh, of a smear campaign that, that rendered him into a target. Seeing what... Uh, a, a, a leading intellectual said about him it's 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 clear that it wasn't you know it wasn't social media that made us worse people they only increased the 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 the, the diffusion of the the sometimes horrible things we say to each other 50 years ago in a may morning uh, luigi calabresi left home to go to work he said goodbye to his wife and he'd never see her again they killed him uh, they sh they shot him in the street what happened in these 50 years? The state in these 50 years has, uh, ha has done its duty. It's made an inquest, it's found, found those responsible for men who belong to continuous struggle. They were arrested, they were put on trial, they were, uh, they were put in prison and uh, in, some of them were paroled. Arrested, uh, put on trial, sentenced and then freed. In these 50 years, Gemma Calabresi has done something in far greater. She's forgiven them. This is what we'll be talking about today in this conference on, titled exactly about this, where freedom is pos uh, forgiveness is possible. The road to forgiveness, lo uh, 50 years long, is what, um, f is what uh, her book, La Crepa la Luce, which many of you have read, talks about. And I'm sure many of you who haven't read it will will certainly buy it in the library after now in the, the bookshop now. And this book has had a wide effect up and down Italy. Today with uh, Gemma, we want to not only recap her story but also to be helped to understand why was she able to forgive these people? How does how does she uh, keep uh, keep fuel this uh, this forgiveness? And and how can we learn from her? And emulate her forgiveness those of us who've suffered things that are far less bad than what she has so firstly to, to kick off this uh, this dialogue the the road to uh, to your forgiveness was was long was you know 50 years where did it start and why I'd like to say that there's there's no rules about forgiveness it's a, it's a long, arduous, difficult road, and it's a, it's a slippery one. The only surety that we have is through the gospel. When we, we look at Christ, at the apostles, how many times are we, are we meant to uh, forgive? He says 70 times 7, or in other words, always if you're about to bring your offertory to the altar and something comes and it comes to mind that someone is angry at you leave that you're offering by the door and go first and ask forgiveness reconcile yourselves with this person Jesus and the gospel they they spell it out very clearly they teach us to forgive and Forgiveness isn't, it isn't a question of reason, of intelligence. Forgiveness is, it's a gift. You give it only with the heart. It's in the word. It's a gift. And so it must be given with love. Let's not, you, you can't fool around. You have to want it. You have to look for it. You have to, to chase after it. Even if sometimes uh, it, it seems counterintuitive. So when did it start? It started that morning, right that morning, even if it, it, it took ages. On the 17th of May of uh, 1972, they killed my husband. 
I was at home and no, no one had the courage to tell me straight what had happened until my uh, parish priest came and I, I held him by the shoulders and I told him does Sander please tell me the truth and him with a single movement of his lips without without no voice came from his mouth he told me he's dead I was literally catapulted onto the the sofa as if there has been a shock wave with a a, a, a a blinding pain the, the, the feeling was that of, I'd been totally abandoned as, as if nothing made sense and in that uh, feeling of abandonment I was there with Don Sandro comforting me I, I can't tell you how much time maybe it was a, a day an hour but at a certain point I, I felt something change as, as if someone I felt somewhat muffled as if someone had had held me as if I, I, I couldn't hear the doorbell the people crying people angry the doors slamming I could feel a sense of peace I felt an incredible sense of inner peace uh, a, a very strange sense of peace why do I say it's strange because how, how on earth could I feel peace in that moment? And right after, I felt a great strength. As if someone was telling me that I could do it. And there, I, I, Don Sander at that moment, him and I, we, we prayed for the family of the, of the murderer. Who, whose, whose pain must surely be far worse than mine. It can't have been easy to be the, the, the killer at that time. Uh, uh, and if he was a, even if, if, even if he was a strong man, God in that, in that moment showed me the way. He, he, he gave me a path to follow. He, he, he was a witness to me that morning. Uh, uh, I received the gift of faith from God. The the greatest gift I could have ever received. Faith doesn't remove uh doesn't free you from suffering from pain, but it gives it new meaning. It doesn't make you feel alone anymore. Faith gives you hope. This is the most important thing. The thing we must never lose. I was already a believer, I was religious because of the traditions of my family but it wasn't something I chose, it was more a question of habits. From that day on it, it became my faith, my choice. And faith is a very different thing from being religious. Faith is life itself. Faith is is happens every day in every moment. It accompanies you. It, it it breathes new life into you. You know, it's it's not something that you do oh only when it's when it suits you. So that morning, I had to choose the. Uh, we had to choose the um, the obituary to put in the Corriere in the newspaper. So. A, fr a dear friend of mine proposed me some that the words Christ said on the cross Father forgive them for they know not what they have done in that moment I would never have been able to do that but I accepted thinking that it was the right time to, 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 to break this chain of hatred and of violence with some words of love And this was my obituary, which uh, I thought about for a long time, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, we'll, we'll meet it again further on. So, Gemma, the story you make in your book, it, it truly accompanies us to, to, to think about how these moments you lived right at the beginning, they'd eventually become awareness and life, but immediately then, it wasn't that 
straight away someone's able to to react to something so dramatic like what you went through by fully em embracing I'll try and interpret what you're saying here to try and embrace this peace that you felt and you tell us in the, as well in the book that uh, in those first few hours the first f one of the, some of the first emotions that came through was 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 a very human rage and you you, you tell us an example of that rage do you want to elaborate Even though I felt strong, I'll never forget the, 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 the companionship of God in that moment. I, ha I felt years of rage, of discomfort, of, of tears, of sadness, especially those first months. I, I, I didn't tell that story for 50 years because I was, I was ashamed. I imagined myself as if I was, I was worn a wig to try and... I thought I, I could hide among the the covens of the terrorists to pretend to uh, embrace their cause to pretend to agree with them to, to befriend them to wait and I would imagine that one day this is when I would fall asleep before falling asleep when I went to bed I, 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 I'd run through this, this thought of vengeance that one day would say we've done it maybe congratulating themselves I killed Calabresi and in that moment I imagined that, that I'd have opened my purse I'd have taken out a gun and I'd have shot him this was what I imagined and so I'm, I'm, I'm deeply ashamed I still am to tell you this story I think it's it's human for a 25 year old but why do I tell this story? Which it's not, it's not a, a learning, uh, a lesson for the young people. I, I, it's, it's, to, to, it's, a, it's a warning to not remain fixed in, in fear, in anger, in rage. To, to, to be a, to become obsessed with, uh, with hatred, to become petrified by violence. We, we need to move on. We need to, to get up. And I wrote that to say that I started from the, the lowest point and the most sad point of my life. And yet you can move on, it's possible, even afterwards. After, after such a, a, a blinding pain, after such a death like this, it's still possible to love life. It's possible even after betrayal to believe again in, in in other people and you can still change your your view on people even uh, those who who wished you all the evil in the world it's it's possible to, to still be happy and so this is why I, I I tell this story because I I'm not a saint I I, I had these thoughts and it seemed to me that they they made it seemed to me that they were they buoyed me but I but in reality I, I felt terrible because when we follow f thoughts of violence that uh, don't deceive yourselves they don't make you feel better they always slowly chip away at you so I wanted to, to share these thoughts with all of you to share this story I wanted to uh, to test them to act to have act this as a testimony but I wanted to entrust you with this because by entrusting my my journey of forgiveness means that even means that today you are now participants with this and you will no longer let me slip along that road I imagine many here among you uh, uh, can, can relate with you that they're, 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 you're a 25 year old with three kids and who have felt these kind of these impulses of rage and I ask myself how were you able to live in that period and not uh, for, I'd like to, to show as we talk uh, a couple of your your family photos from that period so that we can um, you can show us if you could tell us uh, what these first years were like with your, your young kids, you were alone trying to get to grips with this, this pain and with this temptation of violence
So I'll t to tell you the truth, even if in those first years I was so angry, I still, from the beginning I made a choice to give, to pass on the joy of life to my kids, to, to live in the same, with the same joy I had as a child. And so I really tried to, to make them play to, so that they'd be happy, that they'd have fun. I, I pretended because at the end of the day maybe I, I'd go to bed crying, but still I did what I could to, to, to make sure they still had this joy of living. I always thought that you couldn't teach your kids hate and anger. Hate and anger devour you. Hate and anger don't let no longer let you see anything that resembles life. Could it could be a new friendship, a sunset, uh, some scenery. Your 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 kids growing up, their discoveries. If you wake up in the morning and you have hate in your heart, that's a lost day. It's wasted, and I'm convinced of this. So I taught them. To, to, to have a sense of humor that which they're, they're the same one their father had I gave I told them to, to trust them to trust others and I always told them that it's it's easier to, 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 to be good to find good than to find evil and I'm convinced of this even today I, I'd remake this decision every time so moving on on this journey with your uh, your journey of forgiveness, in it's, you tell us in the book that uh, it's clear how important you, your your work in the school was to you with the kids, how how these kids somehow managed to to, to wake up to a, a series of reflections in you to to catalyze some thoughts. You you, you tell us of the of a person of a story like this. So with this, this episode, can you tell us how much your work was important for you? So I, I was teaching religion in a primary school. It was absolutely fundamental to me. It was extremely important because children are so spontaneous, so transparent. And I, 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 I value dialogue a lot. So often we talk about their families or about their the, the dynamics in class of their jealousies of their, their gossips and I taught them to, to 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 talk to not bottle things up to express themselves or to externalize their feelings because by by by, by what they'd call um keeping a sad face by always um sulking we need to talk rather we need to uh, clarify things and we need to ultimately that making peace is the right decision and I thought I, I teach them something that, that I I'm thought I'm teaching them something that I as an adult I don't know how to do and that maybe I even don't want to do I was on that road but it was it was very difficult for me one day one of my um, students taught me you know, there, was, there was something that was important was going on but one of my students taught me miss when someone dies, do they always, is, is it, do, 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 we always talk about it, do, do only the good guys die? And so I told him, well, no, that's, that's right, because we, we have to remember these people, we have to talk about them, we have to remember the good example they set us, the, the, his, his values, his joy for living, his passion, everything that, uh, that, that he was. And, and we need this to live uh, in a positive manner. And then I added, I wasn't very happy, but surely God in his infinite uh, mercy, he, 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 he'd uh, reward us for the good we do and not for the evil. When I left the classroom that day, I, th I thought... I thought of the, the, the question this child asked me and of my own reply and suddenly I thought to myself so even even Gigi's as assassins the ones I always called assassins with bitterness I underlined this because that's what they were for me they were murderers and all of a sudden I thought well even Gigi's murderers were not were not 
just evil. Surely they were not just just that one act. They they must also be good fathers, and I. I I, I'd seen them during the trial, how uh, loving they were to their own children, and it was something that, that had struck me and that I'd kept in my heart. They must be good friends, these men. They must have helped others. Th they must have walked in the steps, just like the same steps I did. And so I told myself, what right do I have to, to condemn them forever? Uh, according to the worst act they've committed in their, of their lives. How can I do that? How could I possibly f uh, f permanently I identify someone according to the worst act they've ever done? There must be, there's, there's plenty more things. Just think about how one, d in, in a single day, how many emotions we go through. How can we possibly relegate these people to one evil action forever. All of a sudden, I saw them in a new light. I, I saw them as, as just like me. I gave them back their humanity. I gave them back their, their life with all its complexities. I gave them back their, their human dignity. And I no longer called them assassins and murderers, but those responsible for his death. And there, I, I did exactly the opposite of what the terrorists did in the 70s and the 80s. When they, they chose a, a target, they dehumanized him, they made him a symbol, uh, a target, uh, a thing through uh, slogans, that manifestos, what the writings on the wall, newspaper articles, so that then they could kill that person even with the, the consent and the understanding of the public. And this is something I'd, I'd want to tell all the young people who are in the room or who are listening online. Never, never take this, uh, this, this pre-packaged hatred just because Someone, a leader gives it to you, or someone you deem stronger gives it to you. Always judge someone for yourself. Uh, do your own research, inquire, ask, try and understand, to, to understand, to get to know, and then make your decisions, then act. But always keep, maintain your critical thinking, your individualism, and your free thought. Don't be slaves to the, the teachings of others. And so this, this choice I had for me was to, to see them in this way was absolutely fundamental for me. From that day, I, I truly, I walked, I only took steps forward from there. No longer did, would I slip back. It was absolutely fundamental to, to finally see them differently, to see them as humans, to see them as, as one of us. And so, in this way, I, I rediscovered myself, and I told myself, Jen, you've, you've, you've written, you've signed this, it's time to, to make this a bit, the bitchery you wrote your own. And I thought, Father, forgive them, because they, they don't know what they did. But why did, did Jesus, the Son of God, why couldn't he forgive them directly? He, you know, he, he's, got, he's holding all the cards. He could have said, I, I forgive you because you don't know what you've done. And I told myself this. I thought, well, Jesus, he was capable of doing it. But in that moment, he was a man. He was divine, but in that moment, he was truly a man. And as a man, he became aware of just how impossible it was for, 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 for men to forgive in a time of physical and spiritual pain, in a time of betrayal, of anger, of abandonment, in the time of, of loneliness. And so he, he gives us this path to, to ask the Father to, to do it him on our behalf, to do, for him to do it on our behalf, this forgiveness. 
so that he may give us the time to complete our journey. And this, this freed me, this thought. It made me feel lighter, as if a, a burden had been taken from my shoulders. I'd understood that God had already forgiven them on my behalf, and I had the time uh, to, to conduct, to have my own journey, and I would not have been alone to do it. I was sure of that. La descrizione. The description of what you said before in the way that you started to see the assassins of Luigi in a different way and not stop calling them assassins and realizing that they were much more than that. The description is the exact opposite of what I experienced a couple of years ago when I was a reporter in the United States, when I tried to uh, talk about the uh, the attitude I saw towards the death penalty. Many times we are shocked by um, the, the uh, way that um, a prisoner in America can be on death row for 20 years and in prison for 20 years and then be executed. There is a great significance uh, tied to the word closure. A person who has been killed, a person who has been killed by another person, their family cannot, their relatives cannot find closure until that person has been killed themselves. Many times this concept shocks us Europeans. And what you try to do is a different type of closure, a sort of conclusion of a journey which has another kind of breath to it. We have this temptation to not, in a sense, condemn them to death, but we, of course, have that temptation to throw away uh, the key. And if you had to a talk to a person who's expecting justice from something as dramatic as what happened to you, how would you explain to them um, that what kind of the kind of closure that they would need? First of all, I would say that the death penalty is a, the same thing as revenge. It equals revenge. And so therefore you will it's an illusion. You can't get away with just that. In this expectation I think you don't give the opportunity uh, to uh, to the responsible, the people who are responsible to the assassins, to you don't give them the opportunity of really repenting, and you don't give them, you don't give the victims the chance to really do a journey of forgiveness. And I would like to say that. I think in these places we should absolutely abolish the death penalty. This is a journey of social, uh, a sociological journey we should all undertake. How much less anger would circulate in the world if we abolished it? If only a couple of people tried to undertake this journey. Instead, people become imprisoned in the expectancy on one hand, for in the anger that someone, uh, in the anger that one has been killed, and on the other hand, imprisoned in the anger that someone else be killed, and there is no way which has, benefits no one. Forgiveness is made possible, also, thanks to uh, how judges express themselves in trials. Accord, what is the role of the state, therefore, in this case. We're talking about uh, the point of view of the victims and justice being served. Yes, I have to say something, that truth and justice are fundamental for history and for the journey of, uh, the journey of a people. They are fundamental for the history of a family as well. I think that truly, my journey of forgiveness, I began to undertake it once I got truth and justice, and truth and justice were recognized to me in f through the magistrates, through the judges, 
who looked after, who looked at my story, at my history, and looked at the truth of what happened. And this helped me. It's fundamental. Of course, it's important. Truth and justice are not death, the death penalty, however. Many people have asked me, but why, if y why after such a, a sentence do you start talking about forgiveness? Well, it's actually justice that helps you in this journey towards forgiveness, in your choice, in your decision, because you don't feel alone. You feel like you've been accompanied. And the state has a role in this. It has its important significance in this. Your journey towards forgiveness, without leaving the, the topic of justice and truth, your journey also brought you to uh, vi vi prison visits as well. Considering the title, A Passion for Man, of this meeting, we need a lot of, we need this passion for man in order to go and back to pris the prison and visit the, those who were responsible for this act. What did you, what did you get out of this experience? I was uh, invited to the Padua prison because there was actually a party there. There was a chaplain, uh, there was one of the prisoners who was receiving uh, the sacraments, baptism and uh, communion and confirmation. I had been invited to this celebration, to this ceremony. First of all, it was a beautiful prison. It's an experimental prison. And I understood how important it is for a prisoner to work because they explained and they talked about their work with such a dignity uh, there were many people, they had different types of work. Uh, they, res they worked in call centers. They uh, looked after the food and looked after the maintenance of the prison. And they would talk to us about this with joy. And they felt, they didn't feel like they had been, they had been marginalized from their society. But they felt that they were close to daily life that was outside of the prison. They felt like they were a part of this daily life and not that they had were people that had been excluded from daily life. All prisons should, should uh, organize themselves along those lines. After this, I asked to be able to speak with one of them who were, had been imprisoned uh, for life. And I talked to one of them because I wanted to know whether if someone after having killed someone else was able to embrace the faith and to become religious and take the sacraments. Both of these two um, life uh, uh, prisoners who were serving a life sentence in a very dramatic moment in a one of the two said to me that he had thought about committing suicide in such a difficult moment in such a tragic moment they heard an incredible peace within them they felt a great strength within them and they had the sense that they had encountered the presence of god this was exactly what I had experienced on that sofa. Think about what it must have been like for me. This was another thing that really helped me. I have to say I'm very lucky because I had that student who told me that thing in the classroom. And then when, when I was in the courtroom, I had seen how the affection of Sofri and Bompressi towards their children. And I had kept that in my heart. And now this event that happened at the Padua prison, I was also ashamed because up to that moment, 
I was under the impression that God had come to me because I was the victim. But there I realized that God goes, came to everybody. He has not just come to me. And this was a great certainty, a great joy. God really goes to everybody, visits everybody, to all those who suffer and all those who need him. And so therefore, this was another reason, an additional reason, because I had thought that for everybody used to tell me every day, had told me about, I uh, had said that they had lost someone and I thought I had done the opposite journey in a, in a way, but we had encountered, uh, we had encountered each other in the middle. You need to applaud very loudly so she can hear you. I hope that that applause reached you. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. You said you talked about a certainty about God that reached you for, on, because of them. And this, you talk about this in the book. I speak to God quite often. Praying becomes a very important part of my daily life. And you quote the prayer group on WhatsApp, the rosary on TV 2000. What is prayer for you? And I know you wrote it in the book, but I'd like for you to explicit, make it explicit for us. How it, prayer is fundamental in this journey because it was very imp it helped me a lot. I would never have been able to do without prayer. Initially, when I used to pray, I used to actually struggle because sometimes I even got bored. I felt I just did it out of duty. But then, slowly but surely, I realized that prayer did not just stay there between me and my bedroom, but it began, it wasn't abstract, it became something that entered my daily life. When we pray, we talk to Jesus, we talk to, about the people that we love, and for what happens to ourselves in our lives, in, on, for, and about what we see on the television. But God knows all of this. He knows what we actually need. So why do we pray? What's the point? Because prayer creates a fraternity, a brotherhood between us and everybody else. This puts this love, it makes this love circulate amongst us. And then it goes up to the sky. It's offered up to the sky. And when I, when I pray, God already knows what I'm asking him. And he helps. It's an act of faith and becomes an act of brotherhood. If, if I have time, I'd like to just tell two quick stories about this. Once I was on uh, Lake Como and a man about my age comes up to me. He's got white hair and his hands uh, outspread. He says, how good it is to see a dear friend. Do you know what I mean? And I said, I don't know what you mean. Maybe you know about me, you've you thought about me. He said, the day that you became a widow, that was the day me and my wife got married. And we were so shocked by your story that we decided to bring you into our marriage on our wedding day. And for every day we have said a prayer for you we embraced ourselves very tightly and I said this is why I managed this is this is how I was able to get through this this is how we all got through it 
another time, I went to give a testimony in Switzerland. Uh, a lady came up to me and said, I used to live in the same house as you in Milan. The house was divided into two. There was a part that looked onto the footpath and from which you could hear the shots. And then there was a part that looked onto the garden where you couldn't hear the shots. I couldn't, I didn't hear the shots. She was at home in the house with her mother. She was about to leave. They heard the gunshots. They went to the, the window and they were shocked. The mother got scared and withdrew from the, the window, but the lady remained there at the window and looked at the scene. The mother took her and said, come here, we have to pray for their family. And we said a Hail Mary for you. And then I said, that's why God came uh, when I was on that sofa. I didn't even know what had happened and there were already people praying for me. God came to that sofa. What more could I have asked for? So, prayer is very important. Prayer walks, it has legs. You have to imagine it like that. It brings, it puts us in a communion amongst, between ourselves. Your call to prayer uh, created an applause and this is how they responded to what you said. In your journey towards forgiveness, many people, uh, and especially journalists like myself, those who attempted to divide Luigi Calabresi from uh, the situation with Pinelli, what I was really struck by was the episode of Pinelli. Can you tell us about this uh, story? So, yes, the media, there was politics involved. They wanted to put us one against each other and they wanted us to be enemies. Thankfully, we were always able to step backwards and remain silent. Pinelli's widow said it very clearly. I never thought that Gigi could ever be responsible for that death. And in the same way, vice versa, I never thought that he could have put that bomb in Piazza Fontana because Gigi had always spoken well of him to me. Yes, they were different. One was the police commissioner and the other one was an anarchist from Milan. But there was a sort of esteem and respect for each other. They used to talk about, they donated books to each other and discussed the violence amongst young people in Milan. Therefore, we in our hearts knew the truth. On the 9th of May, we could say the recurrence of the terrorist act for terrorism in Italy, Giorgio Napolitano wanted to give a clear sign of, re of reconciliation to the country, making these two ladies meet, the two widows of Pinelli and Calabresi. When they told me about this initiative, I actually had a bit of anxiety, but then I thought, even in that house, in that family, one day, the father never came back home.
as soon I went straight to her. We gave uh, we gave each other. Uh, we took ourselves by the hand and we embraced each other. And she said to me, this, "It was a pity that we didn't do this before. This is an encounter that I really look at with love and affection." Uh, we lost a bit of the audio, unfortunately, but you can all see, read this anecdote in the book. Of course, this is how we're obliging them to buy the book. Yes, we do a bit of marketing here. It would be impossible. Unfortunately, it's a, we cannot get you to sign and autograph the books. Yes, it is a pity, but we'll have to make up for that someday. Yes, we'll invite you next year. As we get towards our conclusion, that episode with Pinelli's widow, I'd love for you to tell us about the only encounter that that you you had with one of the four um, condemned. In your journey towards forgiveness, what significance did that encounter have? It was a very important moment. I've got to say, it wasn't really mine, this encounter. It was one wanted by my son Luigi, those who, the one who'd never met his father. And he took with him Paolo, and the two of them went to, uh, to tell me of a, a meeting that, met, that lasted two hours. A very difficult meeting. But they came home with, with a lot of joy in their hearts. And as they were coming home, he, he sent a text as they were, dri as they were driving. They, they said the feeling of, of guilt that, that, I, that I was racked with every day after having met him. I feel like they'll be finally f fixed. Uh, things will get easier. I thank you for this, uh, the chance for this meeting. Then the summer later, or a year later, I'm not sure, Luigi wanted that I go with them as well to meet the fa to meet the family, even his daughter. And it was a, it was a, 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 an encounter that brought me joy. The 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 he the man tried to say I was I was only the getaway car. There was another man who I didn't shoot your your husband, but I I told him, look you you drove the car but you knew what was going to happen. Because you you, Marino you knew what was going to happen. You were you were driving Peter a gunman to to, to my husband's house. I said, you don't have to try and make your your guilt lesser you you you're all accomplices to this but but i forgive you it it doesn't matter your role i f i forgive you and so he told me in that same time i i feel i feel like i've i've betrayed my uh, my colleagues cuz when he confessed he had to uh, to give up the names of his accomplices and i told him marino when someone tells the truth, you never, you, you, this, it can never be a betrayal. I'm convinced of this. Gemma, in your, this, your ongoing discussion with, uh, with God, there was a moment in which you, you, which you tell us in the, in, uh, in the book about, it's as if you'd kind of looked at him, uh, uh, looked at God and told him, what do you want from me? There are those who, those who undergo uh, an enormous trauma like what you went through at 25, those who lose a loved one through illness, it's, you, you had the same thing, both happened to you. Do you want to tell us about Tonino and what happened to him in your, your journey and, and if this changed your journey towards forgiveness? 
I got remarried after 10 years. I got remarried to Tonino Milite, a very generous man. A man who, who, who took us in, in in our entirety. He took all of us together. It's much like, like the supermarket. It was buy one, get one free. In this case, he, he, he got a lot of us for free. And he, he, he always loved us in every way possible, truly. Because he, he, he didn't act like a father, he was a father. He, he truly loved us all. And he, he always supported us in our problems and our struggles, our sadness. The, uh, the, the trial, one of the, the longest trial in a post-war Italy, it, it lasted 11 years. And he helped us, he, he, he walked with us, he followed us. Always, you know, he was a respectful step back and f for, throughout his whole life, I was called, even before him, uh, even when I was married to him, I was always called the Calabrese Widow. And so one day he told me, he said, I'm the ghost. It was a, he, was, he was always a bit of a joker because it seemed like he didn't exist to the media. And when to, uh, Tonino was diagnosed with Parkinson's, then he had a tumor. And sadly, he died in a, in, a mo in a time when I wasn't around. Once again, he, him, like Gigi, died alone. And I received the news alone. And I've got to tell you the truth, I was so angry. I went to my parish priest, who wasn't the, the one from, uh, from 10 years before, and I told him I was angry. And he told me, you're right, be angry. Be, be, be enraged. The, the person, that there have been plenty of people that God have loved, and and uh, have been angry at him and he's helped. You, be angry and God will help you, I promise you. And thus it was. Uh, I can't ask you to, to not tell us the story of how you uh, how you two met. It's an amazing story. Will you quickly tell it to us how you met Tonino? How it went that day. So I met Tonino at school. He was a new teacher. I saw him at the uh, uh, in a, a teacher's meeting while he was preparing stuff for the day we we had a chat that day and in the, and that those that time as we were, we were, we were looking for uh, for new religion teachers i was in the office working to try and be a, a supply teacher along with another friend of mine uh, my friend evelina who was the the secretary in the office he would often come to the uh, to the office. He'd bring a couple of flowers. He'd bring some biscuits. And Evelina said, "Look, he's he's coming for you." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? I've got three kids. Are you kidding me? Look, he's coming here for you." And he always pretended as if nothing was ha was going on. One day we were there in school. We were we were both leaving, and I asked uh, if he wanted a lift. He lived quite close to me, and he said, "Oh, of course, gladly." We got in the car and he started to say, you know, what do you do? And I told him, I immediately told him, I, I'm, I, I'm a widow with three kids. You know, I've never told him anything of the sort. And he looked at me and he said, oh, on a, on a, on a state uh, salary, it's going to be hard to, uh, to live in uh, all five of us. This was what he told me. I was, I was dumbstruck, I was driving, and I was like, what, what did he say? You know, was after a month he invited me uh, to go for a walk, and, and that's when he, uh, he confessed to me. Even before then, he'd, he'd, come, and he, he'd come one evening, 
he taught at a, a what was called a design school, and he he came, he passed, he wanted to, to say hi to the kids, and he he recognised something I had hung up on the on the wall where it said to the Calabrese widow with love. He read this. Uh, this note, and he, he was the only person in Milan who didn't know who I was. It was impossible. He was the only one there who didn't know me, didn't know my name. He sat there on the sofa and he told me, G give me, give me something strong, very strong. He'd understood uh, what, what world he'd, uh, he, was, he was getting involved in. Let's wait a sec there, as there's a good round of applause for you. Gemma, we're coming to the conclusion, to the end now. You've helped us, I think, uh, a, a lot in understanding the, the complexity of, this, of your journey, uh, so this 50-year odyssey, and how this speaks to all of us. If I could quickly add, as far as the kids are concerned, it's not that I said you you have also you must uh, must forgive them, or you must imitate me. No, what I've always tried to to do is to be a role model. I, when I started this journey, uh, I was aware of of where I was, of of my, of my discoveries. You know, I, I might read the, the gospel. I, I, I'd try and show them something. You know, read how uh, here how the gospel says how we should um, we should forgive. I'd try and, and tell these to, to tell them my story step by step. They they didn't forgive as I forgave, but I'm still happy. Maybe when they're my age, they'll they'll be able to forgive as I did. So I wanted to ask you, let's try and make a final brief reflection. I think this, this can't not tie into the fact that forgiveness is part of the, the better part of Italian culture. If, we, we, you know, if, this is part of the, the, if you think of the greatest piece of Italian literature, the, um, the betrothed, Don Rodrigo, the father, it's a whole story of forgiveness. It's, it's the greatest uh, kind of role models we have in this country. And th their tide is kind of the, the best we have to, to our history, to our tradition, to who we are, to this entire journey of prayer that we heard about. We're in a, an extremely complicated mo uh, time, Gemma, now in, in our history, in, for our country, for the world as a whole. And I'd like to ask you about how in the as part of your reflection on um, forgiveness, who do we look to 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 remember to remind ourselves of who we are? What what helps us to uh, to forgive? How do we remember that we, we are these like these characters from the betrothed? We often forget. Well, how would you uh, how would you answer this? I think like it's with with prayer, like we said at the beginning, but also knowing how to. Uh, how to be aware of, of what happens, of our day-to-day, -day. be able to, to read through between the lines. I wanted to just reply with an answer, with an example. Often when I would talk to my kids, maybe we'd be talking about something Mario wrote in his books, uh, or with his brothers, we'd be talking about the fact that a person who's lived through a tragedy, it, it could be a, a ballerina who dances with no arms, or people who, are, who, who lose, become, who lose their arms and their legs. Uh, people who, are, who, who go to the Paralympics, who lift themselves up, who have is, illnesses but keep going. And I say, well, there's God accompanies them the whole way. And they'll tell me, well, do you not think 
Do you not believe it's, it's their own internal strength that drives them? Yes, it's the strength of humanity. But the strength of humanity, this internal strength, God gave it to us through Jesus. And that's why we must feel him close, because he, he gave us this, this gift, this extraordinary gift of humanity, this, this strength. And through this strength, we are capable of anything. And I am sure that, that God is, accompanies all of us. I know this for a fact because I felt it. And this is why I have this certainty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. L'applauso si prolunga. They're still going. It's a shame I can't hear it, but I can see you. I'll stop them for a second just to say I'd want that you all that you, you, you go to bed, not with Myers, but with the Gemmas. I won't add anything else, but let's uh, let's thank her with one final applause. Thank you, thank you all very much. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Gemma, for being here. You know, even if it didn't look like it, you, you, were, you were here among us. Thank you, Gemma Calabrese. Thank you, all of you, and good night. dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza. sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido.
l'aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Giustani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido.